Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. You know I appreciate you coming to me every week for stories and advice. Got a really good topic th- today. With me is Sherry Yarborough. She is caring for her mom, who I, if I'm remembering correctly, is 93 and Six. 96. And she and I are going to discuss caregiving when you have had a difficult relationship with the person that you love, but not necessarily can always agree with. So thanks for joining me, Sherry. Thank you for having me. You're I'm, welcome. I'm very excited to be here. Well, why don't you start by giving us your background, telling us about yourself and a little bit about mom. At least I was close on the age. 96 is amazing. Um, I'm, I've been on my caregiver journey through all Alzheimer's dementia for 13 years. And it started in the summer of 2010 when a routine doctor's appointment abruptly threw me on that caregiver path. Now, I had known since I was 24 that of the three siblings, I would probably be the one to care for our parents as they age. But at 24, I thought, okay, I'll see the care needs coming. There'll be this sort of regal fanfare, and then I can step royally into my role. Well, um, yes. (laughs) I'm sorry, I'm laughing awfully hard just because that's such a good prediction of how most of us thought we would enter caregiving for our parents (laughs) and and obviously I was was 24 you know and I was proud of myself that I was being forward thinking and being aware but uh you know 25 years later what I got was wind chimes screaming and gale force winds going (laughs) no I like that description too. <laughs> and had there had there been signs? There were, but I didn't realize that I didn't realize what I was seeing when I saw them. Um, my sister had earlier in the year, my sister had a really serious health challenge, and so my mom and I had to go to Atlanta to to deal with my sister and there were times when she would be very confused like at the um hospital cafeteria and she would get confused about what to read on the menu and and things like that and i i just thought okay well this is this must be incredibly stressful to be in a space where you think that you're going to lose your child so i didn't realize that what i was looking at was the onset of alzheimer's dementia so was her diagnosis, you said it was a routine doctor's visit. So her diag, it, it, how do I want to word this? She was diagnosed fairly easily or what, did it take a, many years like many people end up with? No, no, it, it, was, it was right then and there. And what was interesting about the, what was interesting there was her doctor at the time had known me and her and my family for a very long time socially because of this there was a Spellman and Morehouse connection so we had known each other for a very long time and basically he said I'm glad you're here um, I'm happy to see that you showed up your your mom is in the early stages of Alzheimer's dementia and she can't take care of herself anymore so you need to move in with her Jeez. <laughs> Oh, nothing a little blunt there. <laughs> well, like I said, we had that familial social relationship because of that Tom and Morehouse thing. So there was a level of comfort that he had in, in dropping that on me. And I, I just kind of sat there and went, uh, okay. But even though he had known us socially, he didn't know the behind the scenes story. And so while I'm sitting there trying to pull myself into some semblance of order, 
every fiber of my being was screaming, no, absolutely not. No, no, this is no, I'm not doing that. And he kind of felt my resistance and he would not let me out of that room. And he wasn't confrontational. But it was very clear that he was not going to let me out of the room until I agreed to do it. So I did. And it was it was really hard. Um, you know, at 24, I had no idea that caring for, even though I'd made the decision to care for our parents, I had no idea that it was going to entail moving back into my childhood home and living in a space that I, living in a space where I didn't want to live. And that had to be hard. It was. And so I, I had to go out and hide out in my favorite thinking spot on the shores of Lake Michigan and just spend the day there, really trying to wrap my brain around this. And so I made a decision that, okay, if I'm going to do this, here's how we're going to do this. We're going to keep all those emotions in a nice box and you're going to stay focused on meeting her care needs. You're going to do what she, what needs to be done and take care of the things that she can't take care of and we'll create that boundary and you'll be able to live in this space. How did that work out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah. <laughs> I did pretty- I do have one quick question. So she sure. was diagnosed fairly early. And one thing that we've learned in the more recent times, for lack of a better way of putting it, is to not take away things that they can continue to do for themselves, and not to be a helicopter caregiver. Was she really out of stage where she needed you to move in and help out and take over and all that good stuff? Or was she still competent in some some respect. She was still competent in some ways, but he told me that she wouldn't be able to take care of her medicine properly. So I needed to be there. And it, and speaking of being a helicopter mom, yeah, I, I, I am. I, I, I'm a helicopter mom because she can't tell me if something's wrong. So I'm constantly watching. And, and there are days when I have to take a deep breath and go, okay, Relax, relax, relax. It's, it's okay. It's just a boo. It, it, just relax. <laughs> just relax. Not the end of the world. <laughs> exactly. So I, I tell people, um, yeah, I'm, but I'm still sort of this new mom thing. And as the disease and changes, I'm still like in that new mom, two, three year old space because something always happens. And then I have something new with which I have to contend and the helicopter comes back again. <laughs> well, there does come a time when helicopter caregiving is more necessary, but not necessarily in the early stages. That can breed resentment on both sides. And, you know, if they're not using their abilities, they're going to lose them even faster. So we definitely don't want to do that. That's why I asked that, because I would assume he would have known if she needed help. Thankfully, there are options with medication. There's a really good company called Personal Rx that is absolutely designed for people like us. And they even have, um, they have technicians, pharmacy technicians that will call, make sure your loved ones had their medications. It's, it's a really good um, system. And I will make sure that their website is linked in the show notes so people can check them out. But back in, what did you say, 2013? 2010. 2010 lordy that was a whole other whole other lifetime ago (laughs) exactly so you know there i was and so um in in our relationship there was this cycle of anger because we didn't get along not because of anything that we had done directly to each other but because of spillover from the relationship she'd had with her mother my grandmother thought it was appropriate to vent her frustrations and put her footprints all over my mom when she felt the need to do so. And my mom never talked back. She just swallowed all of that anger and pain and frustration. Well, it had to go somewhere. 
and she vented it at me. Well, problem was, we have very different temperament. So when she would come at me with that, I would push back as hard as I could. In my mom's perspective, she thought that tolerating what my grandmother was doing to her was a show of respect. And by the time I got to be a teenager and I became aware of what I was seeing, I saw nothing respectable about my grandmother's behavior, and I saw nothing respectful in my mom's behavior for tolerating it. So I wasn't having any parts of that. And so for many years, that created tension between us because my mom felt that I didn't respect her. That's some, somehow spills over 100% when somebody's got a cognitive impairment. They, they seem to remember those emotions and those feelings. They may not remember incidences, but they see you and that like seeing you triggers those negative emotions, which is definitely not beneficial. My parents were very good at making sure I understood that nothing I did was ever good enough. And the only time I ever heard praise is if I overheard them um, expressing their proud proudness. I'm not sure is the correct word. Their pride. There we go. In something I had done. If they were expressing that to somebody else and I happened to overhear it, then it was like, oh, okay. But they, I guess they wanted to make sure I didn't get a fat head. So they weren't like overly effusive and complimentary which I kind of get. I mean, you do have to keep a balance, but they kind of tipped the wrong direction, in my humble opinion. And Alzheimer's is really great at teaching you that nothing you're doing is enough, and it's you're just, you're just fumbling along. <laughs> so the disease really ramped up those feelings, and that was, that was challenging because it just, you know, I always kind of felt like I was approaching my mom with, like, dread and fear it's like oh my gosh am i going to be able to make her happy today and it's just there's a lot of pressure it, it but, was and we lived in that cycle of anger where we get angry and stay angry and then we kind of start speaking to each other but then it really wasn't very nice kind of snarky when we did talk to each other and then we would just allow the anger to just die down and we never dealt with why we were so angry. And we lived that way for about 18 months until two utterly small but terrifying words barged into our lives, and that was breast cancer. So when she was diagnosed with breast cancer, it was terrifying. And it put me in a space where I had to stop and make a decision. I had, I had accepted the fact that Alzheimer's dementia was going to be a long journey. But breast cancer, that was something different. That's something that could quickly shorten one's lifespan. So I had to make a decision. I had to decide whether I wanted to spend whatever time we had the way we had been or did I want to choose to live differently? And I chose to live differently. And so on this journey through, through dementia with someone that I'd had a difficult relationship, the most important thing I've learned was that the hardest part of being a family caregiver isn't performing all of the tasks and taking on all these new responsibilities. It's taking on those tasks and performing those responsibilities while you're feeling what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. So in that, I, because she had, she'd had dementia, had been diagnosed with dementia for about 18 months, she could not make complex decisions about her breast cancer treatment. So that became my new role of her decision maker. And so it was up to me to choose. And I had to choose how I wanted to live. And so in that detour through breast cancer, there were three things that I learned in, in, in managing this difficult relationship. Number one, choose how you want to live. Number two, 
make a commitment to that choice. And third, and most importantly, get support. Definitely on the support. So, now, did, did you go to a therapist to help you make that mental shift, or did you just knuckle through it on your own? It pounded me upside my head because my mom asked me a question for which I had no answer. The first doctor we saw proposed a standard treatment protocol for breast cancer, and she was 84. And he proposed that we do a mastectomy. Okay, that made sense. Makes sense. Get the cancer out your body. Chemotherapy to kill the cancer cells, and then radiation therapy to kill anything that was left. And I remember sitting in the office, doctor's office, going, now that sounds like an awful lot to do to someone who's 84 years old. And then he said, but, but there's something, that, I've got some good news for you. Her, her tumor is hormone receptor positive. So I said, okay. I'm sitting there, and he said he had good news for me, so I'm sitting there going, and the good news is, <laughs> and the good news is, and the good news is. So You're he, definitely waiting for some good news between Alzheimer's disease and breast cancer. What a journey. Exactly. And so finally, he just, you know, as he's going through his standard treatment protocol, I asked him, so what does hormone receptor positive mean? And he stumbled and fumbled and fumbled through some sort of explanation. And I remember sitting there, but he never told me how this good thing would impact her treatment plan. And my brother and I laugh about this now. He said, he said, I saw it on the look on your face. He said, your eyebrow went all the way up to your hairline. <laughs> And I just looked over at him and, I was, and he said, I thought to myself, dude, you can stop talking now because you're done. <laughs> it's it's hard to imagine that they would recommend that uh, stringent protocol, you know, that aggressive a protocol in somebody that's 84. And exactly. then you add and then you add on Alzheimer's disease. And it's like, are you looking at the same person or are you just looking at the tumor? That just blows my mind. Because when you get to 84, you've had a really good long life. And something's going to get you. We don't, none of us live forever. I know there are people that are trying, but so far, none of us live forever. So it just seems. Exactly. And so in that, that space, it did just kind of hit me that if I, if I followed his protocol, would that help me live the life I wanted to live? And I knew I couldn't. I knew it wouldn't. It did not feel right. It didn't feel right for her, and it didn't feel right for me. And taking this that detour through breast cancer gave me those three things that have to happen in changing the relationship with someone with whom you've had this difficult relationship. But it also made me think about, I'm a part of this, and I have to think about what I'm doing in a way that allows me to get to the other side. And as you said, we're not immortal. And at some point in time, this stage of my life journey is going to end. And so what are the memories I want to carry? That's an excellent, stage ends? That's an excellent way to look at it. Cause I was going to ask you, I think, go out of a limb here. Most caregivers don't ask, how do I want to live my life? We somehow get very wrapped up because of love um, and caring. And so it's not a negative, it is a negative thing, but it's not from a negative place. We get so caught up in trying to fix them, do the best we can for them, do everything for them that we forget to ask, how do I want to live? So do you have any clue how you got to that question? Yes, because after, <laughs> when we left the hospital, I was confused, and so I knew she was overwhelmed. 
know, in this space of earlier dementia, she just simply could not process that information. So I went home and I did what I always do. Like, okay, if I don't know something, I'm going to research it. I'm going to sit on my computer and I'm going to, I'm going to dig. So after a few hours of digging and I'd started some networking, I was so proud of my research and what I knew. And so I went to talk to her as this mature, rational person that was going to support her in this difficult journey. And I told her what I found and she reared back and she gave me her steely eyed, no nonsense look and said, what would you do? Mm. <laughs> not that that was, that was a good question. Not that it was an easy one, but. No, that was a question to which I had no answer. <laughs> yeah, those are, those are challenging because you're making, it would be hard enough to make that decision for yourself to know if this choice is better than that choice, but to have to make it for somebody else. I had a, Similar, but not quite as dramatic, at least I don't think so, experience with my mom. So at the start of March 2020, you know, that infamous month, she fell and broke her leg. And she needed surgery to repair it. I was very reluctant to put somebody with advanced Alzheimer's under anesthesia. I don't know if it was COVID or, or her advanced Alzheimer's, but the surgeons never really pressed. You know, like my experience is surgeon, surgeons want a surgery and I didn't feel that with them. They, I had about a week to decide if she was, if we were going to do the surgery or not. And one of the clinchers was she was going to need physical therapy, whether we did the surgery or not. And she was absolutely uncooperative with the physical therapist. And I thought, I can't pay this person and take time to, you know, help him help her. No, this is just not going to work. And I just, I felt like, okay, well, we're just not going to do the surgery. And I'm really glad that that was the choice I made. I assumed that breaking her leg, it was less significant than breaking a hip, which we're also going to get to shortly. Um, but that was the last straw for her body. So she broke her leg March 8th and she passed away March 31st, which during COVID was wild. There was a lot of pluses and a lot of negatives. But yeah, when you have to sit there and decide, you know, am I going to have her leg repaired or not? And, you know, it's like, well, it's not a fun place to be in. No. And when you have that underlying um, discord, it makes it, it just ratchets up those, those emotions exponentially. I did experience that. I don't think I was aware of it, but now that we're talking about it, I think I experienced that. And so, as I said, the, that detour through, and when she hit me in the head with, what would you do? And I really had to step back and think about, what would I do? And what would I want? What would I want? What, how would I want people to support me in my battle? then I could step forward and say, okay, knowing her as I do, what am I going to do to help her fight her fight? And so the first thing was to find a new hospital, which we did. And immediately in meeting the new oncologist, meeting the oncologist up front. And by the way, the first doctor at the first hospital was the surgeon, which is why he couldn't explain hormone receptor positive. It's not an oncologist. And I, I told her what I met the oncologist and the oncology nurse. And she said, oh, no, we would never, ever do chemotherapy on somebody that old. Yes. And at that point, it's hard, it's hard on your body. And at that point, everything went. Whew. OK, so now we're in a place where they're focused on her living, not just surviving cancer. And that made me think, okay, got to got to go through these these steps, and then they didn't hit, hit immediately. So it was sort of after the fact that I realized I had to make a choice. Do I want to take whatever time I've got and live it how I've been, 
or do I want to live differently? And what that what's that going to look like? And so I needed to make a commitment to myself. And the commitment I made to myself was no regrets. Mm -hmm. I was determined that I would not live a life with regret rocks. The would have, should have, could have regret rocks in my life backpack. And so in order to do that, I needed support. And I encourage all of our listeners to get support. God, you cannot do this by yourself. You can't. You just you can't. It's more than one person can do, no matter how focused, competent, dedicated, um, determined you are. You are one human being. And so you have to have support. And how that support is going to look different for each person and the support you need is going to be based on your choice and how you made your commitment. So whether it's several um, groups, group settings, support groups, or whether it's a one-on-one -on -one with a therapist, whatever it's going to take, that you have to have that support to help you fulfill the commitment of the choice that you made. Makes sense. I facilitate a support group and they're amazing. They support each other. I just need to open the Zoom window. They don't need me very much. <laughs> They're amazing. And so I also want to encourage them in this process. It's not like a checklist where you go, made my choice, check. I have my commitment, check. I have my support in place, check. No, this is a cycle that you go through to make a lifestyle change. And so it gets you into that lifestyle of, have to make choices that include myself. I have to make a commitment to myself to fulfill my choices. And I need support to help me on those days when I'm questioning whether my choice and my commitment are the right things to do. There's several several people in my support group that are that also attend other support groups because mine's only once a month, which is definitely not enough for most people. So it's wonderful that there's other in-person and online options so don't don't feel like you're being selfish or extra needy if you have to join multiple groups and you're going to benefit differently from each group would be my my assumption i was in a support group and then now i facilitate one and they're similar but different it's it, it, it all it's all based on the per people that are there i'm glad you said a very important word Selfish. And I can only speak for this, speak to this as an African American woman, because that's the only experience that I've lived. But selfish was one of those things that you were taught not to be. Mm -hmm. That was a no no. And if you're going to be doing something for somebody else, you're not supposed to be selfish. But I've learned in this role as family caregiver, I have to be selfish enough to be self-preserving. Mm -hmm. I don't preserve me. This whole caregiver thing is going to fall apart. This whole house of cards is crashing down. Exactly. So you guys, well, let's take one step back. Can you briefly explain what the cancer, the hormone, now I can't even remember all the words. Hormone receptor positive. There we go. Oh, it's, it's, an, it's a very important characteristic where the, I'm going to try to explain this quickly. The cells on the, the ends of the cells are open, which means hormones are, it will accept those hormones and they can t take those hormones and it helps kill the, kill the cells as opposed to traditional it's a form of chemotherapy but it's a form that's that makes the body turn on itself to attack the cancer and it's a lot less um taxing than traditional chemotherapy she had one little pill 
just one little pill once a day. And that was that. No infusions, no, none of that stuff. And so she didn't have to live sick mm -hmm. trying to get well. Now, there was a trick. There was, there was a little twist to this. The particular medication she was given um, could exacerbate memory loss. Uh oh. <laughs> decisions, decisions. Exactly. So that was one of those spaces where I had to step back and think, you know, we got really lucky. There was no, when the, when, when the mastectomy was completed, they checked the margins and her lymph nodes, and there was nothing in there. It had not broken out of its pocket. So we were lucky there. But they wanted her to take this medication just in case anything was left. And I had to think to myself, okay, what's going to be worse? Me saying, what's riskier? Me saying no and the cancer comes back and we're not as lucky the second time around as we were the first time? Or in the space of Alzheimer's dementia, it exacerbates already the, mem the memory loss that's already happening. And which can I live with? So I said, well, I can live with, we, we will work our way through the memory loss. That's less terrifying than the idea of this disease coming back, this disease that can take her life quickly coming back. That's, that's so, interesting. So, so did you notice, did the medication dis, dis, bleh, decidedly make the memory loss worse? It was. It was a slow progression. We were progressing slowly. And about six months after she had to start taking the medication, then it was like, okay, memory loss is here. Mm. This is real. And it, it's funny. Um, at that same time, I was going, I didn't know anything about Alzheimer's dementia. So I was going to every forum. I was reading everything I could. And Chicago has two NIH dementia centers. So we're really lucky. So they were always having forums and this things and that. And I, I was going to as many as I could. I was listening to the stories of as many Alzheimer's patient caregivers as I could. And all of a sudden it was like, okay, I am having information overload. <laughs> And I was so focused on what she wouldn't be able to do that I lost sight of what she could do. So when the memory loss became really apparent, I had to step back and think and say, okay, well, well now wait a minute. What is it she can still do? And once I started looking at what she could still do, all of that stress and being overwhelmed about what I didn't know and what I was expecting to happen just kind of went away. And it helped me understand I, I, something. Alzheimer's dementia is like that wonderful line from Forrest Gump when Sally Field said, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Well, that's For Alzheimer's sure. dementia. <laughs> it's definitely life too. <laughs> And, you know, because with Alzheimer's dementia, everyone doesn't get everything. And then the symptoms that they do get don't prevent, present as severely from one person to the next. So you, just, you won't know what you're going to get until it gets there. So being able to step back and look at, okay, what is it she can still do? Okay, she can't put her shoes on by herself. But once she gets her shoes on, we can go out to the park. She can't tell me which direction she wants to go in the park, but if we start in a way, she can enjoy where we are. Mm -hmm. So looking at life from that point of view of what can she do? And she can still travel. Now she has her limit of two to two and a half hours in an airplane. Any longer than that, it's going to become uncomfortable for me, her, and everybody on the plane, so we don't do that. <laughs> you're, 
you're not you like those um connecting flights then <laughs> no we just take one short two hour flight and then we're done so wherever we are and so that's how i found where we are in florida it's two hours from chicago we can handle that <laughs> And this time of year, it's definitely better in Florida than it is in Chicago. <laughs> Absolutely. So she can handle that. And what else can she handle? She can't handle restaurants because there are just too many sounds and sights, and she's on information overload. But she can enjoy eating her lunch in the park and hearing the seabirds. Mom and I used to go to the park and watch kids. And she, we kind of did the same thing. She, getting from point A to point B was not always easy because she watched her feet as she walked and she refused to walk elbow and elbow or next to me or in front of me. She really, really risked face planting on the sidewalk. Thankfully that never happened. But it was, it was a challenge to get from the car to the bench. But when we were at the bench, it was like, you know, you could just, you could almost see a little bit of brightness, like, the alertness went up one or two percent just from being outside in the fresh air and the sunshine and you know just the relaxing um sitting on the bench and just watching and listening to kids and it's amazing it's a lot easier to take the squealing and and the kid noises when you're outside <laughs> than when you're inside it's a little much inside <laughs> i i um i i tell people figure out what it is that vibes with your loved one and stimulate her brain or his brain in a way that she can process. A lot of people say, well, what about mind stimulating things like um, like puzzles or Sudoku or things like that? And I said, at one point that was okay, but as the disease progresses, they're not able to access information that they know. So it's it can be very frustrating if she's working a crossword puzzle and she comes to a word that she knows she knows, but her brain just won't let her have it. And how upsetting and frustrating that can get. So I tell people, I won't say don't do it, but just watch how they're engaging. And if something, if they're pulling back and feeling like, seeming to be uncomfortable with it, stop. Just move on to something else. Yeah, I went through that process because all of the standard advice, simplify hobbies they used to enjoy, none of that stuff worked with my mom. It was so frustrating because it's like she would, we would do very simple, not childish, but simple craft projects or art projects, Some sometimes as simple as a leaf rubbing. We'd walk out in the regional park and then do a leaf rubbing next to a lake or a pond or whatever and she was always afraid of doing it wrong which was very frustrating because it's like you can't really do it wrong and it doesn't matter it's art whatever you do you just do to have fun and that just for whatever reason never resonated with her so i finally had to give up i tried multiple times <laughs> i don't know who who got more frustrated her or me but that's that's where we were at. <clears throat> and, and, Excuse me. And so, think, thinking of that, um, there was a point in time when she always liked to read, so we had to change what she was reading. So we shifted from adult books to teenage books to child books, and my mom was a kindergarten and first grade teacher. So Dr. Seuss came back out. And, it's always fun. I remember mm -hmm. reading those with, with my daughter. I could I could have done that with my mom. Dr. Seuss came back out. And it was something that she remembered because, well, it was something that where she still had a connection because that's what she did with her kids, with me and her kids in school. And it's simple and brightly colored, but not too overstimulating. We also started watching children's movies. She could follow the storyline a lot better, and it was more comfortable for her. That makes sense. I know a lot of caregivers that watch Disney movies with their loved ones, which 
there's something in it for everybody. So that's actually mm -hmm. a good thing. There's, there's, since your experience started, your journey started, there's a lot more reading material geared for people with um, mm -hmm. cognitive challenges, which is also really good. But I was going to ask one quick question. So there was a big benefit to the medications your mom went on. So I, I mentioned something about breaking a hip. Oh, yes, yes, yes. My mom made a decision. And she decided to take off her gripper socks and step into a bathtub. Oh, boy. <laughs> and she had not been anywhere near a bathtub in over a year. But in that moment, her brain said, oh, so let's get in it. <laughs> <laughs> and the next thing we knew, she was on a terracotta floor. Oof. So she she really broke her, broke it badly. And and the one thing that I will say about my mom is when she makes up her mind to do something, she's gonna do a good job at it. <laughs> so when she decided to break that hip, she did a good job. <laughs> that sounds like my mom too. <laughs> So we were out of town and I was really just overwhelmed once again with how to make these choices. And I was scared about, like you, scared of putting her under anesthesia. So I called a nurse friend of mine and she said, and I don't remember the medication she said now, but she said, ask them if they use this, this list of them. And she said, ask them if they use any of these. And if they do, ask them if they can leave it out if she's got to have this surgery. And so when I was talking to the anesthesiologist, he said, oh, no, your, your, your mom's too old for that. We don't do that. <laughs> so I've been really lucky that I've had, hospital, had her in hospitals where the medical staff goes, oh, no, we don't do that for someone her age. And I know that that's not an experience that many people have. And the outcomes can be very, 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 very difficult. Unfortunately, a lot of hospitals like elderly, Alzheimer's disease, next, you know, because it's, they're, they're trained to fix. And if they can't fix you, you know, I'm not saying that that's a good excuse, but like, that's been my experience. Like, what do you want me to do with this person? I can't fix them. That's my job, fix them. So we need we need a little changes there, but that's a whole other episode. <laughs> we can talk about that a, a, a lot. I, I told a, um, I'm part of an advisory group, and I said, you know, I would really love to be part of a doctor's conference where we're talking about what does it mean to live with this person who has a disease but also has dementia. So what does it mean to live with the potential side effects of a person who has dementia? And I also feel like at some point in time, because this is a disease that's going to be in our population because as baby boomers, we're getting older and there are more of us, um, that people need to spend time in, obs in observation not just in clinical settings, but also in homes to understand. I won't call the drug's name, um, but I had a visceral reaction to a new drug that the commercials touted it as being um, the only FDA approved medication for, for Alzheimer's dementia. And then the, they went into the side effects and hearing that with the caregiver's ear, I kept thinking, now, you're encouraging this caregiver to give this person this medication because it's going to help and it's going to help quell their behavior. Well, some of these behaviors are, some of the things that it's going to quell can kill this person so yeah you're going to call the behaviors because they've just dropped dead yeah. and and i know that's and that's just my sarcasm in in trying to wrap my brain around this but even with the minor things 
the dizziness, the possible falling, and so forth. And yeah, their their behaviors have changed, but now you've created a fall risk. And I just kept thinking now, so she falls. We know that if it's a woman, if she falls, she's probably got osteoporosis. So she's going probably going to break something. Even if it's a hairline fracture in her wrist, how are you going to keep that soft cast on to immobilize the wrist of a person who has Alzheimer's dementia and is having trouble processing information? You've just made my life really fun. And I'm being yeah. extremely <laughs> sarcastic when I say that. And so talking with doctors to help them understand, okay, yeah. These are medications, they're, they're fine medications, but you need to understand what this is going to, how the side effects are going to shape the life, lifestyle of both the person taking the medication and the person caring for them. And there is a big gap in there. Um, and I don't think that a lot of doctors really understand ethnography to be able to watch a scenario and under, for understanding. So when you're making this prescription, are you really thinking about the two people, at least two people who are going to be involved in this? That is true. It's definitely something they need more insight onto. But now mom's, mom had an anti-cancer drug that was actually quite beneficial. So what happened with her? So she was how old when she broke her hip? 93. Okay, that's, that's what I thought. So I'm like, I remembered 93. <laughs> and obviously she's still with you. So it was not the last straw for her system as it is for many people. So can you give us a brief history on what happened after the break, broken hip? Well, I'm going to back up a little bit before she broke her hip. As her decision maker, in this hospital where her cancer was treated, they worked as a team. So she wound up with an endocrinologist. I didn't know she would need that, but she, she wound up with an endocrino endocrinologist because she had diabetes. She also had osteoporosis, which endocrinologists treat. So while we were going through this, the doctor said, I'm getting pretty okay results with this one particular medication. I think that I have another one that will do better. So we switched medications and she had been on the second medication and I'll call its name, I'll say Prolia. And six weeks after she broke her hip, the, the surgeon had, we went back for our follow-up visit and he just had this stunned look on his face. <laughs> he was like, her hip, it's completely healed. And she's growing new bone. And I said, that's the prolia. And he went, what? I said, she's on an osteoporosis drug called prolia, and that's what it's doing. So by being in a space where I had a good team and they were helping me keep her wellness in check, you know, six years later, after going on this medication, well, well, after being treated for osteoporosis, I think it was about six years, and now two, maybe three years after changing medication, she had a break, but she was able to recover from that because of what we had, because of the foundation she had. And so being that decision maker helped me, helped me help her. And having that good support medically help you with your choice to focus on how you want to live without regret and without, you know, the anger. Or I'm assuming that's the case. You're nodding your head, so I'm not speaking out of turn. Oh, yes. It, it, and when she was about to be released from the hospital, after the mastectomy, I had no clue. So getting a home care nurse to help me understand how to really do the aftercare. Yes, the instructions were very clear. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what to expect. 
So having someone saying, okay, yes, we're on a good good path, that got that set of emotions out of the way, and then that helped me reconcile all those other ones, which helped me get into that cycle of choosing how I want to live, making that commitment to myself of no regrets, and then, again, circling back to the support that I have in order to be able to do that. Well, that is a perfect place to end because you summed it up beautifully. No regrets. That's how I lived with my grandmother and my mom. I'm still not sure I succeeded with mom as well as I wanted, but it was okay. I did the best I could. And I am grateful for you to that you reached out and offered to share your journey because people don't talk about what it's like caregiving no. when you when you really don't like the person that you're caring for. No. And, and I didn't. Now, here's the other thing. I didn't like the fact that that was in our relationship. So. But I had never thought about what I could do to change it. I had just accepted that it was who and how we were. But these two diseases forced me into a place where I had to choose how I wanted to live regardless of what I had been given. And I want to just leave the, um, your listeners with something. Guilt is a useless emotion. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't fix anything. It doesn't help you grow. So Very true. we try to do your best not to feel guilty. You're going to make mistakes. Lord knows I make mistakes on a regular basis. But you just try to make whatever mistakes you make, try to make the mistakes that won't be long lasting. And if they are, you you forgive yourself for them and you just keep moving. Not a lot of other options, unfortunately. Except the regret rocks. That's true. We don't want to carry those around. Those are heavy. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I live in the hills, not in the flat part of Florida. So we don't want to be carrying rocks around. No, 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 no. And I think we've all met people who are carrying those regret rocks and they fail to release themselves. And just to admit that, okay, I was a human and I, maybe I didn't do it as well as I could have. But I was, I'm a human being and I did what I thought was best in the moment I was faced with it. And as human beings, that's all you can do. Yeah, they don't, they don't give us a, an instruction manual for living, raising kids, caring for elderly people. There's no instruction manual, so. No, no. Now your TV and how to troubleshoot your cable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm that. <laughs> That is true. And we do have Google, but I don't know about that one sometimes. That's why I like talking to people like you who share their stories and help other listeners like ourselves. You know, if all they have to do is take away one little piece from today and, and we've, we've improved somebody's life, I hope. So I really appreciate you sharing the story with us today. Well, thank you for having me. And if there's ever anything you'd like to know, feel free. Just give me a jingle. Certainly. I love sharing. <laughs> You're very good at it. Thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.